Excuse me. I think we'll get started because we have to vacate in an hour. So, but we did want to leave a fair amount of time for discussion. So we'll see how that goes. If we don't run over too much. Well, I bet that the people here might share uh, a certain attitude about e-law as an institution. I'm not too sure. I haven't been to e-law. I live in Eugene, but I haven't been here in a few years because of uh, it. Just seems like they haven't they haven't connected to reality very well. Probably most people here consider law the code of the system and uh, and doubt whether we're going to be saved by lawyers. You know, probably there's a little doubt there. But you know, a few years ago, in the early 2000s, ELO was always an excuse, uh, if you will, an occasion for lots of people to come together that had really nothing much to do with ELO per se, anarchists uh, or firsters and so forth, and maybe felt a little bit on the outside, but it was okay because people reconnected. There was a lot of re, uh, you know, catching up tabling, partying, and so forth, and in the general tent, I guess, of ELA, but uh, not, the, not the official part of it at all. Well, we're here to say a few things about Black and Green Review, which kicked off last year. If anyone remembers Green Anarchy Magazine, I, I would say it's, uh, it follows from that in a lot of ways. Um, that, GA, as it was well known as, was 2000 to 2008, I think we did about 26 issues. And so it's been a while since Green Anarchy. Now there are other anti-civilization zines, such as Black Seed. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that one. There are, there are differences, but I mean, in general, uh, the anti-civilization critique and outlook has spread, I think. Black and Green in general, I think, is trying to contribute something in terms of vision, in terms of analysis, and in terms of the personal, what people go through in this, in this stage of civilization, and in terms of contending with it and uh, resisting. We know that every civilization has failed, and now there's only one left. There's just one big global civilization, and uh, it's failing grandly. I don't think probably too many people miss that. It would show up for something uh, like these, these events we're having here. The, the eco-catastrophe is obviously arriving, and I'm not going to go down the list. Everybody knows about that. And in society, these are some of the things I think we're trying to grapple with and help lend a voice to. Part of the gravity of it, part of the extremity of it is, uh, it isn't just the physical environment, obviously, it's the uh, rampage shootings, right? Happens every day now. I mean, we're seeing, we're seeing something happen in mass society that engenders that kind of thing. When community is gone, community is gone. It's not, uh, the word hasn't gotten out officially quite yet, it's, it's one of the most uh, public secrets, you might say. <coughs> and I think we're trying to also address technology. That's been neglected in many circles, radical circles, anarchist circles, if you will, and I think that's a very big omission. And there's a lot to say about that, but I think one, one uh, maybe one large point that I feel is that we've actually been seeing uh, kind of a vacuum. A, a severe erosion in the political ideology that holds things together. Fewer and fewer believe, for example, the claims, the promises of enlightenment, the, the main uh, ideas of modernity, after all. Uh, they, they failed. The science and technology isn't saving us. It's, it's uh, driving the ruin. Uh, we haven't passed from the age of superstition, if you want to put it that way, as they did in Enlightenment, uh, 18th century, to where, well, there'll be no more uh, religious intolerance. People won't kill each other for religion. This is the, this is the age of reason, after all. Well, how, how has that worked out uh, the past 200 years or more? 
Well, and just, just want to mention a couple of things about technology. I, I'm hoping they're becoming more, more of a banality, more, more people already know this, but we're, now we're having the replacement of political ideology, I would say, by technology itself. Uh, to put it in a sort of reified statement. In other words, one of my favorite favorite mantras is IBM. Let's build a smarter planet. That that always kills me. The planet is stupid, but with technology, it gets brighter. Well, we're supposed to forget that technology, in its wider sense, has created the very problems that it comes around to say, "Oh, we're going to fix everything." There are problems, but you know, with more and more faster hyper technology rushing in, it will all be okay. And we're all empowered by more and more and more technology, forgetting somehow that we've never been more disempowered. And we've got the great uh, cornucopia of diversity from technology. Meanwhile, the homogenization, the standardization, the globalization is happening at a rapid pace. Hundreds of languages are made to disappear every year. So whatever you look at, oh, and another big one, of course, is isolation. We're connected now. You know, we're, we're just, we're streaming around the world. We're, we're milliseconds away from anybody on this planet. Well, if you look at this society, among others, people have never been so isolated. And that really, that gets back to the shootings. When the community dis disappears, rather largely driven by the whole techno thing where it becomes a, a technological mass society more and more by the hour. Uh, no, we're not connected. That's, that's the most super, superficial, quote, connection there is. More people live alone, people have fewer friends, you can go right down the list, it's, it's just there in all the sociological studies and so forth. All these things are blatant lies. But that has been what is taking over, because you've got to have something to hold society together when the political stuff Wayne so much that so many people who they don't swallow it anymore. It's bullshit. These these things uh, haven't come to pass. They, they don't hold up. Well, I'm gonna just I'll kind of leave it at that. But I just one more thing. I, I just came back from uh, Tucson uh, about an hour ago, as a matter of fact. And one of the things that I think um, informs a project like Black and Green Review. Is, the, is listening to and learning from the indigenous dimension, past and present. I, w I was able to help out with a benefit for Ootum people on the, on the border in southern Arizona, uh, traditional Ootum. And they're trying to hold on to their lifeways. They're faced with all the, all the massive surveillance, oppression, abuse, militarization on the border. And their ancestral lands across, uh, on the other side of the border, they have to deal with almost a fantastic level of cartel violence. This is the autumn reservation, it's the second biggest one in the continental US. And there are, there are a significant number of, of uh, autumn people who are traditional. And that's a link that I think is absolutely important. Well, just one last thing, sorry to go over it for you, but uh, let's look at, uh, just for a second, Occupy, remember how that came and went? Big, big failure, it went nowhere. Well, they could have been deoccupied. Could have, there could have been a, a change of orientation, away from the progressivist destruction toward deoccupy or decolonize. That didn't happen. People still clung to the leg legacy of the left, that's, that ain't cut it. That's part of the problem, not part of the solution, as we see it. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> All right, my name's Ian Smith, and a lot of my writings can be found on my blog, which is Uncivilized Animals. For our purpose today, I was gonna talk about my contribution to the forthcoming issue of Black Green Review, where I'm looking mostly at what role, if any, spirituality might have sort of an anarcho-primitivist or green anarchist context. And I wanted to s preface that by saying it's kind of an odd experience for me to be <clears throat> up here talking about spirituality because largely my attitude toward religion has been um, 
a hostile one, justifiably so, I think. Um, and so this is in many ways new terrain for me, trying to, trying to find something of value in what has largely seemed to be um, without any, you know, which has largely seemed to be kind of more of a threat, if anything. <coughs> so <coughs> I've always sort of loved this David Hume quote, <coughs> talking about hostility towards religion. He says, examine the religious principles which have in fact prevailed in the world you will scarcely be persuaded that they are anything but sick men's dreams. I just love that, like, cutting, vicious kind of language. But I only just recently noticed that there's a qualifier earlier in that sentence. You know, religious principles which in fact have prevailed are nothing but sick men's dreams. That leaves out a lot. Looking at religious principles or spiritual practices that haven't necessarily prevailed maybe outside of the context of civilization, maybe where we want to look for something of value. <clears throat> so I've started and sort of put a toe into this water with, with the assertion that the faith of a green anarchist is faith that the sun will rise tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That may seem like a really low bar. It's a starting place. Right? And I mean this kind of both figuratively and literally. So. <clears throat> Probably everyone here is convinced that the sun will rise tomorrow. You probably could not believe that if you tried. But it's kind of a jarring experience to realize that we couldn't begin to prove that. <clears throat> it's just something that you know, we don't have access to. It's a claim about the future. And we could assemble all of the experts on campus, all the books from the library, everything we know about planetary motion and gravity and the life cycle of the star. And all of that information wouldn't give us what we would need to prove that statement that the sun will rise tomorrow. <clears throat> and it's Hume again who points out the problem with this. That any argument you make is going to assume that the future will resemble the past. And there's no non-question begging way of getting to that point. So <clears throat> there is an element of faith in even these sort of very, um, you know, irresistible conclusions that we come to. And so with that, I want to say that a green anarchist spirituality might rest on, <clears throat> rest less on sort of assertions and more on acknowledging our animal limitations. And it's important to point out that these are limitations that are inherent in us as physical beings. They're not temporary limitations that we can expect to overcome in the future. Uh, David Abram makes this point pretty well in his book, Becoming Animal. He writes, each creature, two-leggeds included, has only a restricted access to the mystery of the real. As a human, I may have compiled a great mass of data about the ways of the world, yet in a practical, visceral sense, an earthworm knows more about the life of the soil than I do, as a swallow knows far more about the wind. To be human is to have a very limited access to what is. So there's that literal element about not knowing whether the sun will rise tomorrow. And the figurative is that we're kind of liberated, in a way, when all of the predictions that we might hear, hear at ELA about, you know, the dead planet that we're, that we're approaching, the end of life on Earth, all of the doom, to realize that all of these predictions are based on a very limited access to what is, that there are many, many more variables at play, that we are unaware of and can't be aware of, I think provides grounds for hope that life may find a way to prevail, even if it's you know, beyond our calculations and predictions. To suggest that we know the time and date when everything is going to expire is kind of an act of hubris. To think that the world, is, the world and the universe is clockwork and we can predict it is something we have to move past. <clears throat> so moving from that's sort of like the theoretical basis that makes me feel like I'm entering the waters of spirituality in good faith, so to speak. Gives me sort of permission to move forward. But turning to practice and maybe spiritual health, I'm thinking of this in terms of you know, that spiritual practice and spiritual health is going to be portioning our time, attention, energy, and effort in accordance with our considered convictions. To the extent that we're able to do that, we're going to be spiritually healthy people. <clears throat> And I've kind of found inspiration on this point from an unlikely source, unlikely for an anarchist perhaps, which has been, almost by accident, you know, the history of Christian monasticism and the lives of saints. 
because to enter the monastery is a very deliberate decision. And it's a way to, you know, monastics, Christian monastics have found a way to engage the world on their own terms, to prioritize their considered convictions, and to build their life around that. I don't feel like many of us have that, have that opportunity or, or have sort of strategically thought about how to allocate our time and attention in accordance with what matters to us. I think most of the time, what matters to us gets squeezed into the weekend and in odd blocks of time that we're not being pulled in other directions. <coughs> You're going to take this quote from Thomas Merton, who's probably the most prominent Catholic monk of the past century. Writing in his autobiography, he says about joint entering the monastery, he says, there could be no more question of living just like everybody else in the world. There could be no more compromises with the life that tried at every turn to feed me poison. That is such a radical sentiment. It could be in any sort of radical zine. It could be in a communique announcing some sort of... Uh, you know, animal liberation or some sort of destruction on behalf of the earth. It's such a radical sentiment and it's a rejection of mainstream modern values. It's a rejection of consumerism, of aspirations towards power or notoriety that I find that really compelling. And it's a rejection of all the values that anarcho-primitivists reject. So the continuity between these two things is, is striking at times. Now the criticism that's going to come really quickly usually is that monasticism for many is or could be perceived as escapist, uh, fleeing from the world, uh, a dereliction of duty, of, of unwillingness to, to wage sort of a political fight. I'm sure that's the case for many people, but probably the people who flourish in this environment, it, it hasn't necessarily been the case. So in the paper that I have coming up, Black and Green Review, I look at both Thomas Merton and Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer wasn't a monastic, but aspired to building a monastic community if he hadn't been killed by the Nazis. Um, and in Merton's case, he becomes more politically engaged with, with the politics of the day and more consciously aware of the moral significance of the natural world after joining the monastery. So in his journals later in his life, he says, the great work of sunrise again today. Note, you know, Cap noticing the extraordinary in an ordinary everyday event, recognizing that it doesn't have to be that way, but it is. <clears throat> Continuing, this is the awful solemnity of it, the sacredness, unbearable if you really put everything else aside and see what is happening. And how often do we have the chance to put everything else aside and see what's happening? That's the idea of, like I said earlier, coming to our considered convictions and structuring our life around that something that we rarely have the chance to do, something that modern life makes almost impossible for most of us to do. Continuing, he says, many, no doubt, are vaguely aware that it is dawn, but they are, for the, but they are protected from the solemnity of it by the neutralizing worship of their own society, their own world in which the sun no longer rises and sets. In modern life, the rise and set of the sun is, is largely irrelevant, something that we don't take notice of, something that we don't sort of incorporate into our daily life. <clears throat> and moving away from Christianity, I'll just wrap up into a context that anarchists and anarcho primitives specifically might be more comfortable and less off putting. Um, Jack Turner, in his book The Abstract Wild, says, I'm concerned with preserving the authority of wild nature, or more precisely, the authority of its presence in our experience, and hence the structure of our lives. So again, an idea about how we structure our lives in accordance with what's important to us. And what I find interesting here is that although Turner is not an anarchist, and so he probably doesn't squirm at the word authority, I'm, I'm expecting that many anarchists would squirm at the word authority there. But what he's talking about isn't the authority of governments and religious authorities, perhaps, we could say as well. Um, it's not the authority that anarchists are committed to dismantling and destroying and opposing. It's the authority of you know, wild nature. It's no different than gravity. It's not something we necessarily have to overcome. So I'm suggesting that we don't necessarily get thrown off by that semantic overlap. <clears throat> so anarcho-primitivism, unlike almost any other political ideology, is about giving up power rather than seizing it. I won't hesitate to say 
that it makes us, in many cases, more rather than less vulnerable. And it's a loosening, of, loosening our grip over nature. And all of these things, making ourselves more vulnerable, loosening our grip, these are all acts of faith. Faith that we'll be okay in the wider world where everyone else beyond humans live. So I'll turn it over to Jariah. Hi, my name is Jariah. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about rewilding and resistance. Um, so I have worked as a wilderness therapy guide for the past, on and off for the past nine years, which means that I take radically domesticated, traumatized, and broken humans out in remote wilderness settings with small groups of people and try to recreate like tribal communities, hunter gatherer life ways as, as closely as possible. Um, basically, just experience intense intimacy with other humans, with the bi with the biotic community, and um, and the experiences that I have had personally have been incredibly healing and powerful for my own journey, as well as the clients that I work with. Um, can really um, I don't use this word often, but <laughs> it really can only be described as magical. The types of transformations that you see within two or three months of the woods. Um, these kids are. Yeah, totally unrecognizable. It's very, very beautiful, very powerful work. So, and this, this work kind of informs my perspective and why I'm sitting up here today and my writing and all the things that I do. So, very similarly to how Zerzan was largely responsible for taking the work of the radical anthropologists and what can be known as primitivism and tying that to the anarchist tradition and making anarcho-primitivism, I, I kind of see my project as taking the work of the eco-psychologists and the uh, healing arts and tying that both to the anti civ critique and also bring the anti civ critique to the world of eco psychology, because um, to me I, I I don't I don't see them as I see them as two sides of the same exact process. One is like understanding this big macro view of how the world works and what is civilization, and what is like how do we embody these concepts. So so basically after doing this work for nine years and after reading every book I could get my hands on for nine years, um, I've come to the distinction that to the opinion that there is no essential distinction between philosophy and therapy. I understand philosophy is just macro therapy, and therapy is just micro philosophy. Um, <clears throat> and one way I try to work with this, and so one of the ways this looks like is I try to take these big concepts that are talked about a lot, these philosophical words, and I demystify them, try to break them down into their myths, and understand how how these how they affect our bodies, how we embody them um, in our day to day lives. So it's easy to talk about racism and sexism and Civilization, but what does this look like in my body, in my day-to-day -day reality? How, do, how is racism, where is racism in my body? <clears throat> what can I do about that? <clears throat> um, so this process of embodying myths, um, I would call domestication. Um, and is, domestication is the process of taking your own autonomy, your own wildness, your own wild nature, and suppressing it, and accepting the myths and the logic of the domesticators, of the dominators, the oppressors, and until um, until there's no essential distinction between your desires and theirs, until you accept their, their beliefs as your own. Um, this is, we can call this Stockholm syndrome, we can call this trauma bonding, <clears throat> we can also call it domestication. Um, so once we become domesticated, we, we then become the zookeepers. We pass them on and perpetuate them. And this is like the trauma cycle. Everyone who does fucked up things in the world has really fucked up things happen to them. We all know this. This is like how domestication and civilization perpetuates itself. We all receive these myths from our parents, um, from our school teachers, religious leaders, etc. We receive these myths and then we then pass them on, perpetuate them. Um, and rewilding, I would describe as the process of one, trying to understand what these myths are, seeing them for what they are, um, refusing to participate in them, refusing to perpetuate them on other people, um, and attempting to locate and extricate them from our own bodies. Uh, basically trying to return to an undomestic, undomesticated state as much as possible. Obviously, it's a pretty lofty goal. <clears throat> so, one of the, these ideas that I want to talk about right now because it's very relevant to this conference and because it's something I've done a lot of work on is resistance. So, basically what might resistance look like taken out of the arena of social change and political theater and mass movements? And what might it look like in my body? What, how do I embody resistance? Um, how do these concepts play out in my body? So I'm going to start with a working description of resistance. I'm going to say I am resisting whenever I am holding boundaries and defending myself um, from any actions that I perceive as 
violent, coercive, dangerous, or just destructive or unwanted. That is resistance. <coughs> so we can pick apart this word self. Um, there's many ways to understand self. Um, I'm going to make some assumptions. Most everyone in this room probably has a conception of self that looks something like um, I am a mind, like, or this cockpit behind our eyes which, which, with which we engage in the world and view the world that extends a little bit to the edge of our skin, and that's pretty much the end of our self. Um, if someone in our culture is talking about their selves, it's pretty fair to assume that they're talking about their physical bodies. Uh, but of course, there's many, there's many other ways <coughs> to conceive self as well. Um, ways of self that extend to other plants, animals, ways of self that extend to the biotic community. Um, just uh, when it, in our book a couple months ago, we were reading the, the Piraha in Brazil, the Amazon basin, and their con conception of self is so rooted in the landscape that they don't even have words for like, like directions. Like if you were to ask what, what hand this pen is right now, I would say upriver or downriver. I wouldn't say my right hand. Because it's totally in relation to where I am in relation to the river. It's like, like their, their conception of self is so rooted in this matrix of where they are located within this larger person, larger vision of self. It's really beautiful, really fascinating idea. Um, so there's a couple ways. A lot, of, a lot of people have never really thought about their conceptions of self, like <clears throat> how do I conceive self? There's some ways to experiment with this and to learn a little bit about it. One way is just, uh, what do you identify with? What do you empathize with? <clears throat> what do you allow, to, what experiences do you take into yourself and allow to affect your body? Um, by that I mean, if your sports team wins or loses, do you feel that in your body? Do you feel sadness or elation? If your political candidate wins or loses, do you feel that in your body? If somebody you love <clears throat> is experiencing suffering, do you feel that in your body? Or if they're excited, do you feel that in your body? And if, if you do, th these are things you can do to start realizing like, oh, I'm, I would use the language of like, I'm extending myself into my sports team or my whatever. Um, this takes place on many levels, objects. Uh, one story I like to tell, because it was super clear to me, was a couple months ago, I, I witnessed a car accident. This lady rear-ended this guy and his truck got dented and scratched, and he got out of his truck and he was just screaming, super angry. And this, it was very clearly an accident, it was not that big of a deal. This lady was in the car, she had kids with her, they were crying, she was freaked out. But this guy had like absolutely no understanding or em empathy for her experience. He was acting as if like she had literally hit him, like he was enraged that she had scratched his car and dented it. And when I was observing this experience, I was like, wow, like, this is really fascinating. He's actively cutting himself off from this relationship with this human and choosing instead to like empathize with his truck instead. And I was like, of course he's acting like this. Like, his truck is an extension of himself. Like, no wonder he acts like this. Like, <coughs> they explain a lot of actions on the internet from now on. <laughs> be really angry about this certain political, their ism gets insulted and they just, they feel it enraged in their bodies. It's like, they experience, you or I experience that as extensions of ourselves. Um, so, but of course, you can also extend self into people and animals and plants and bioregions. Um, and I would say that when you engage in extending self into reciprocal relationships with other living things, it's a, a very healthy and it's, it's a whole world I don't want to really get into right now. But this is essentially the process by which we, we make conceptions of self, which everything you know about yourself is something you learned from a reciprocal relationship with the people in your life. It's a constant process of looking in people's eyes and, and seeing what they're seeing about you and this reflection, it's this edifying, enriching, learning experience that's like becoming human. And when you do this, when you extend self to ideas, to objects, you're not getting anything back. It's like this emotional necrophilia. You're just throwing it out and you're getting nothing back. And it's, it's, it serves as a very alienating and deadening factor. Um, so yeah, this, there's, there's another word for extending self into other other animals, plants, and bioregions, it's called love. Um, whenever you love someone, you include their experience as your own. I'm sure everyone in this room has had an experience where they, one of their loved ones was um, feeling something very intensely and you felt it in your body as well. You were experiencing it with them. You chose to make their experience part of your own. So, coming back to the description of resistance that I started with, but working from this understanding of self, um, that I'm, I'm resisting whenever I am holding boundaries and defending myself. Um, whatever that fluid, dynamic description of self is that you were choosing in that moment. Um, so, if, 
if someone tries to harm or kill a person that I love, whether that person is a human, plant, bioregion, whatever, I am going to automatically defend what I love. I am going to, I'm going to engage because I'm defending myself. Um, so the body, the body automatically protects itself. So if I was to pick up this chair right now and throw it at you, your hands would automatically raise and protect yourself. Um, it's, a, it's a limbic response. It's a, it's a pre-conscious experience. It's not, you're not thinking about philosophy. You're not thinking about ideas of resistance. Um, our bodies, our selves, automatically protect themselves. Likewise, if I was to attack someone you love right in front of you, um, I would hope that you would, defend, you would defend them. And this is an instinctive reaction. And you'd tell me to fuck off. Rightly so. Um, so this just shifts the concept of, of resistance from um, being basically an objectifying, where it's like I am an object engaging with another object, I'm defending you, this like paternalistic, um, in, in inherently objectifying, to a uh, mutually enriching experience where you're engaging, you're defending yourself as an extension of somebody else. So I, it's, it's all language. <laughs> um, so basically, this what I'm trying to talk about here is subjective resistance. Is a, it's very, it can be very healing and empowering. It has been for me, and it's been for many of my clients in the field. I'd say I spent a good quarter of my time out there teaching exactly this. Um, teaching kids how to find their autonomy, find who they are, hold boundaries, decide, basically decide like what boundaries they're willing to hold for themselves. Which is, it sounds simple, but it's incredibly difficult for kids who've grown up their entire lives and had every decision dictated for them by someone else, or by groups, or by organizations. They spent their entire lives acquiescing. This is domestication. It is constantly giving up, and you don't know what your own boundaries are. You don't know what you're allowed to take in your body, because you take everything, like fucking circumcision. <laughs> All these things, uh, schooling, like, you're, every single part of your day is dictated. You're constantly just giving up and giving up. So the process of deciding, like, tapping into your own wildness, your own autonomy, <coughs> deciding uh, what it is that you're willing to give up, what you're willing to fight for, and, and fighting and holding that boundary is a very, very healing process. Um, basically, it's reclaiming your own autonomy. And this is very different from what I would say is objective resistance, um, engaging in social movements, um, political, you know, resistance. <laughs> um, I would say that this kind of like objective resistance is more fixated on like symbols and ideas and slogans. Um, it can be very body denying, it's very distant. It reinforces lack, loss of autonomy. Um, you're giving your agency over to professionals and groups. Um, and it takes an immediate felt experience of anger or oppression or resistance. Like, that's fucked up. I don't want that to happen. Um, and it kind of abstracts. It makes it this idea. And then you go to fuel the movement or a cause or an idea versus this person that's, that, you, that is suffering right in front of you. Um, and it, yeah, basically, it, it can serve to teach us to not trust our own intuition um, as our energy <coughs> moves from a bodily felt experience to a mental experience of an idea of something that we think is wrong or um, unjust or oppressive. And so by changing this focus to subjective resistance, it's ultimately body affirming. It emphasizes an expansive conception of self, um, and it is innately empowering, healing, and rewilding. So obviously, it's a very limited time. Um, as, this is way more nuanced than this like either or dualism. It's not at all like this. Like many participating in a movement can be very empowering for a lot of people. You can have a lot of like honoring your body with while participating in movement. And at the same time, you can be very alienated while while defending yourself. So there's way more nuance and interplay here. But at the same time, I think these two general concepts hold. And that um, when you are you are you defending yourself or are you um, it's like an ascetic press denying myself in order to protect another out of some like political or philosophical uh, affiliation because you think I'm supposed to do this thing. Um, so in closing, unfortunately, you cannot save the world. You cannot protect the wilderness or endangered species. You cannot stop racism, sexism, or inequality. And you cannot stop civilization. You can, however, build relationships with the community of life that surrounds you. You can protect yourself, however you experience that. You can learn what your boundaries are. You can practice holding them. Um, you can reclaim your own body wisdom and your animal intuition, and you can fight for what you love. And uh, it's a very healing and engaging process, and I do engage in it. The end.
So I think the plan is to questions. take questions. I'd like to ask John if you could give us a little historical overview between uh, red anarchism and green anarchism. Well, that's that's the uh, debate in the anarchist milieu. As some some people know. I mean, there was there is the Eurocentric classical leftist red anarchist uh, body of thinking from the 19th century, and uh, it's hard to kind of summarize all this. But one of the touchstones, I think, is self-management, meaning the the industrial development and all that. But, technology, means of production, whatever you want to call it, is to be managed by the people, not owned by capitalism. But, it, but the, green, uh, the green variety at, at base, I think, is that if you want to self-manage the factories, you overlook the fact that the factories are the problem, that industrialism is the cancer that's systematically destroying the natural world. The, the lefty, the, the red anarchist, this is the battle. You know, it's like Chomsky, Noam Chomsky, he's, he's one of the reds. He's, he's totally against, uh, you gotta be progressive, you gotta spread industrialism and technology and modernity and civilization to, to the backward people who have to become consumers and uh, workers and voters. You know, I'm only slightly exaggerating this. He totally hates the green perspective as I'm summarizing it. I think that's about it. The people, I think the green folks, uh, including us, of course, uh, would like to see almost all of this shit go away. Others want to extend it to where there's even more billions of people. Uh, and all these things are linked to something foundational, which, which the left, uh, they collude with the rest of the apparatus of power in denying. This, there's, there's a reason for all these things, a natural population.